Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the future of MRPM, Mobile Repo Remote Patient Monitoring. It's a little bit of a tongue tweezer sometimes. But so I am Maria Palombini. I am with the IEEE Institute of Electronic Electrical Engineers Standards Association, and I lead the healthcare and life science practice. So our panel today includes Michael Carter, who is a program director at Mass General Brigham. Um, with us is Cheyenne Vias, who is VP Medical Director of Teladoc Health, and Narendra Mangra, who is Principal at GlobalNet LLC, and he also co-chairs various standards programs, incubator programs here at the IEEE uh, organization as well. So before we, we get to the great presentation, just a little bit about uh, the IEEE, we have um, our core purpose is really in our mission is advancing technology for humanity. This transcends everything we do here from uh, standards, education, outreach, we do philanthropic projects, you name it, it always focuses on this core element. Um, you know, we have many different um, organizations or technical societies, as we call them here. Um, we have over 400,000 members globally, and we have 1900 plus conferences. I'm sure maybe some point in your lifetime, you may have run across one of our conferences or a member when you, if you were an engineer or a technologist. So like I said, when we talk about advancing technology for humanity, we, we actually, it's inbred in everything we do. And of course, healthcare is an important area. And today, what we're going to talk about is a little bit on the area of remote patient monitoring, how it can hopefully in the future better enhance patient outcomes. The healthcare life sciences practice works with global volunteers, three of which are on the call on our panel today, uh, to really look at where there's a need for addressing gaps or concerns or trust and adoption of these technologies we see coming into the healthcare life science domain. But more importantly, it's to support innovation, improve overall wellness, and improve societal outcome, and ultimately see how these technologies can lead to universal, equitable, um, sustainable access to care for all individuals. So uh, this is the way we, we go about it here. We do incubation and industry connections. We do standardization, which is many of you may be familiar with our most um, famous standard, which is the 802.11 Wi-Fi protocol. Narendra is pretty um, uh, familiar with it. So if you have any questions, he could definitely address that one. Um, we also a membership organization. We do conformity assessment, registries, and that kind of thing. <clears throat> So as we get started today, we have, um, you know, a lot of numbers get thrown around and I, the numbers I have here are probably already wrong, not wrong, but updated or changed or depending on where you read. But at the end of the day, we're talking about millions of patients across the world using more and more of these devices in the name of remote patient monitoring. So sometimes we hear it as mobilized, sometimes it's remote patient, you're just stuck at home or in a site and it's still monitoring you. But at the end of the day, there's more and more. <clears throat> and it's really important because now telehealth kicked in with, unfortunately, because of the pandemic or fortunate if you're into the telehealth space, but we see more and more use of it, more and more use of telehealth. And what does this say? At the end of the day, as that growing usage comes by, we're seeing that cyber attacks on IoT devices across every domain are surging. We no longer measure them in millions, we are now in billions. So this is already one glowing point we see as a consideration when we think about more and more remote patient monitoring. I mean, we could tackle every single challenge from privacy, interoperability, to feasibility, human factor design, there's plenty. And, that's, and our panelists will get to it today. So I had something for you guys to think about as we go through this process is, you know, understanding the growth and innovation and use of RPM healthcare delivering and, and, and clinical research, right? Clarification, how RPM is more than just a device. We also, we often think about the wearable or that sensor or that medical device, but really how it's evolving into a patient-centered um, system. And then making the differentiation between exactly, because now we're seeing this fuzziness between mobile and RPM or MRPM. And then honestly, and when we say we want more innovation, what exactly are we looking for or what should we be requiring? And these are some of the things that we're gonna to get to today. <clears throat> so basically our whole effort here in this session is supporting the, the Converge to Accelerate Symposium is to really we're doing outreach. Um, we, through our global community of volunteers, we identify, they come to us and say here, there's a problem in this domain. We really need to address it. Then we build programs around it, incubation programs in more cases, which is to really address it. And then finally, we actually get into incubation where we're talking about exact applications. So when we talk about 
R RPM? Are we talking about in decentralized clinical research? Are we talking about healthcare delivery? Are we talking about digital therapeutics for mental and psychiatric um, uh, illnesses? Like it goes really into these detailed levels. So we actually build these steps and they kind of grow out of one program. So this is sort of the path that we take before something actually even becomes a standard um, in, in, a, in the world of incubation that we do here. This program, this particular session, touches on one of our incubation program called Transforming the Telehealth Paradigm, Sustainable Connectivity and Accessibility, Privacy and Security for All. It's a multi-phased approach where we're looking at first, how do we address these issues um, you know, from a foundational level? And then once these issues are, how do we support innovation for what we think is going to be a mobilized um, future of telehealth, right? So everything's going to be beyond the site people in motion, people going beyond geographic borders. So this program looks at it from these, it's a multi-year program. It looks at it at a multi-phase level <clears throat> and it's open. So what, what we mean by that is if you're interested, you're an expert, you are a researcher in this space and you want to get involved in helping to develop solutions, we invite you to participate at no cost. You don't, you're not, you don't have to be a member of our organization. Just visit this website and fill out the interest form and we'll let you know how you can get involved. And then finally, we're doing a telehealth competition on uh, remote patient monitoring. This is um, the website. You can find out what the criteria are. We're looking for innovative solutions. So it's not just about this is the next best device for remote patient monitoring, but in it, it's going to address a critical uh, challenge. So like I said, security, privacy, interoperability, extensibility, scalability, whatever it might be, it's addressing one issue that's currently not being fully addressed as we see in the current class of those devices today or in its services and systems. So if you're interested and you wanna get involved in the competition and pitch that solution, please visit our website. So with that, I'm happy to get to the panel. Um, our first speaker is Michael Carter. He is program director at Mass General Brigham. And he's going to share with us uh, some of the great work that he's been doing. Obviously, Mike is um, also a judge on our telehealth competition and an advisor, and he's in our program. But more importantly, he's very active in the space in a lot of innovations. And he's going to share with you some of the great things that he's been working on. Mike? Thanks, Maria. Uh, so as Maria mentioned, I, uh, I'm a program director at a uh, health system in Boston, uh, one of the largest in Massachusetts, in fact. Uh, we are a parent company called Mass General Brigham of roughly 12 other hospital systems. Um, and I manage a, a technology portfolio of several virtual care products, both asynchronous and synchronous, um, which obviously includes RPM, remote patient monitoring. The, the history at uh, Mass General Brigham related, as it relates to telehealth goes back pretty far, as far as 1969, when uh, Dr. Ken Berg was actually uh, conducting virtual exams from Mass General Hospital to Logan Airport, believe it or not. So uh, we're no strangers to telehealth uh, or innovation in this space. If you go to the next slide, Maria. So I think as we you know, begin to look at remote monitoring, let's first define sort of what we, we think it is and, and what its uniqueness is in this space. And RPM is one of those telehealth modalities that it touches really the whole care continuum. And that makes it very unique uh, in a lot of different ways. Unlike uh, some aspects of virtual care where they only really, it's acute or it's ambulatory. This literally touches wellness. It touches the ambulatory space, even the, the inpatient space. So there's quite the value proposition to be made. Um, when we think about remote monitoring, we're typically thinking it as defined as um, biometric or health data uh, being collected in real time, both inside and outside the clinic. That's sort of the definition that uh, my group works from. And the, the, really the, the value proposition is huge because it could improve patient uh, wellness, it can improve patient engagement, uh, adherence, self-care, but also for care teams, it allows them to walk, uh, or sorry, work at the, uh, the top of their license. It allows them to do um, more effective uh, assessments and intervention based on the real-time data. If you go to the next slide, Maria. And so I mentioned the versatility, right? The versatility of uh, RPM. And it really does span um, a variety of different sources. I mean, patients can submit data, right? That we've talked about, you know, that already. They, they have wearables, they're collecting their weight, their heart rate, things of that nature, maybe through, um, a, you know, a, a smartwatch or something of that nature. And they're allowed to share that with their care providers. But then there's the, also the other direction where providers can, uh, 
prescribe remote monitoring uh, interaction, whether it be for um, diagnosis uh, like diabetes, um, maybe it's post-op like heart failure, things of that nature. And, and that allows them to you know, basically collect data from that patient um, without the patient having to be in the hospital. And then that extends to population health. Now, you know, managing the care of multiple uh, segments of patients and, and really be able to effectively manage uh, populations, which leads to things like value-based care models uh, and that's really to, to manage that very effectively. Then there's the research side of RPM. That, that space is, uh, has so much promise where we're collecting data uh, and if we have the ability to store and aggregate that data, then we can start doing more predictive analytics and using things like AI and machine learning to, to basically make these systems work um, harder for the care teams to be honest at the end of the day, because what we don't want to do is add more burden to them. We wanna make these systems easy for them to use. And then lastly, acute care. Uh, I, missed, I mentioned heart failure. We actually have programs at uh, Mass General Brigham where we're managing uh, patients after surgical procedures. Um, at their homes, we have a command center of care team just monitoring their blood pressure and, and things of that nature so that if there's an event coming up, we can either predict it or intervene in real time. So that's uh, some of the great ways we're leveraging RPM now. And just to talk to some of the challenges, and if you could go to the next slide, Maria. This is like any emerging technology. Uh, we, we have some, some things we need to work through. First is the differentiated solutions so from a healthcare perspective. There's a lot of technology vendors out there. Uh, last count, there's roughly 120 plus companies in the US alone. Uh, and that makes it very difficult for uh, providers like ourselves to sort of understand which technology is the right solution for our you know, use cases. Is it one or is it many in some cases? And, and uh, the second challenge I already sort of touched on, which is just with any technology, we don't want to add to provider burnout, especially in, in the times that we live in, you know, with there's like high capacity patients going to the, the hospitals and being admitted at some times. So we want to make sure that the, the technology doesn't increase in the onboarding activities and the device distribution activities of RPM. And more importantly, the analytics side that, you know, it's easy to grab the data you need when you need it. Last, oh, not lastly, sorry, uh, patient equity is another sort of uh, important area in all of telehealth right now, but we want to make all patients have access to these types of solutions, regardless of their tech literacy, um, access to the internet. Um, if they cannot see or hear well, we want them to be able to also take uh, you know, advantage, full advantage of these types of uh, technologies. Security and privacy, more challenges there, especially when we start with AI and ML, we want to make sure that as we're collecting this data, it's being managed effectively, we're validating it effectively, especially if it's going to be part of the legal record, which is very important for us within the healthcare space. Uh, and we want to make sure we're treating that data appropriately so the relevant data is uh, be able to be searched and um, aggregated as needed and only limiting the amount of PHI that really needs to be included in that, uh, that aspect. And if we could go to the next slide, Maria. So the future and, and really the promise of, of RPM here is um, if we can make these solutions very easy to use, we can address many of the, uh, the challenges that I brought up related to you know, uh, provider burnout, whether it be patient equity, things of that nature. So my, I'm advocating uh, as we go through uh, this uh, sort of work together that we can uh, work with vendors to really make their solutions easy to use and, uh, and also making sure that we have connectivity for our patients and they have access to that regardless of which segment they fall into. The second area there is the electronic health record integration, making sure that for us to really get the most value out of our remote monitoring programs, we have to be able to get that data seamlessly into the, the software platforms that our care teams use every day. And they're also dictating our clinical operations and things of that nature. So this is a, a key aspect of, of these types of technologies. I mentioned the data collection for research. This is another area of promise. If we can uh, work with different technology vendors to, to look at different repositories and, and, and uh, whether it be data warehouses, data lakes, things of that nature, so that we can effectively not just store the data, but be able to call it upon it when we need it uh, in, in the most effective way. And the last uh, sort of challenge and sort of promise that I would, would bring to this group is uh, 
interoperability, um, not just amongst the platforms, but also amongst the devices. So we, this goes to the equity uh, piece that I talked to, but we wanna make sure that when we're working with a particular vendor or a particular technology, that we're not just constricted or limited to certain devices, because then that's only gonna to add to some of the, the uh, operational challenges that we've talked about, but also the equity challenges. So I will uh, pause there and, and hand it back to Maria. Thank you so much, Mike. And thank you for starting, I think setting a nice uh, baseline for everybody about opportunity and obviously the challenges that come with it. So next I'd like to have um, Dr. Cheyenne Baez, who is Vice President and Medical Director of Clinical Operations at Teladoc Health to share with you some of the work obviously Teladoc is doing, the challenges they're seeing, and uh, also talk about overall how we can empower patients in a different way. Yeah, appreciate it. Um, you know, I, I think uh, um, many of you may have heard of who Teladoc is, but ho hopefully uh, if you haven't, um, this will be a brief uh, commercial overview. Um, you know, we're, we're a global uh, company. We have been providing uh, virtual care uh, over a decade. Uh, and, um, you know, as we think about um, healthcare, we, we think about um, providing equity, uh, as Mike said, you know, trying to really address the social determinants of health. Uh, and, and I hope uh, your, the audience knows, you know, social determinants of health, um, high level, where you live, where you're born, uh, equals your outcome, your health outcome. And, and so many folks around the world, uh, especially the United States, uh, close to 10, uh, sorry, close to 20 million people do not have access to broadband, uh, just in the United States. Uh, fortunately, that, that number is decreasing, but um, trying to help with the social determinants of health, our, our mission is really to try to get access to healthcare. Uh, maybe it, it may be our, our clinicians, um, or it may be health systems, but really trying to connect people um, to healthcare, and, and that's really what we think about. And and our goal is not to disrupt healthcare. Uh, the word disruption, by um, you know, its truest definition, uh, is to drastically uh, alter or destroy the structure. Um, and and by disrupting healthcare. You, you know, the, the intended or, or unintended definition is to destroy the structure of the health system. And we, we don't want to do that. We want to transform it so that we can help health systems uh, and clinicians amplify the care that they're getting. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, Maria, you know, last year was really transformative for us as an organization. We, we acquired two great companies uh, in that, uh, InTouch Health and Livongo, uh, and both have, um, you know, quote, remote monitoring uh, enrolled in them. And, and InTouch uh, provides access for clinicians uh, to connect with other clinicians within facilities, uh, living beyond the firewall of health systems. So our internet and our connectivity is stronger than the health systems. Uh, and, and then of course, Livongo, um, where consumers don't have to have internet in their home. The devices are automatically powered to many of the things that Mike talked about. Uh, this can be directly wired into the EMR of health systems, but more importantly, this is connected, right? So as Mass General has their command center, we have this as well. Every single device that we use and our members use is cellularly enabled, uh, and we're monitoring it. Uh, and, and, you know, we have a system called AI, AI, and uh, proprietary um, machine learning where we're individually identifying patients' behavior. So a good example of that, without getting into the details, is that if you're a member of Livongo and you have hypertension, just using that blood pressure cuff and, and, and our AI, we can determine many other medical illnesses that you may have. Uh, and so a good example is um, mental illness. Uh, just by detecting the number of ways that you're interacting with the blood pressure cuff, we can detect if a patient has a mental illness or not. And, and, and so uh, the great thing about connecting these companies together is now we can help a Livongo member who has hypertension and we can bring them in into a mental health specialist. We can bring them into Mass General, uh, who by the way, is one of our partners. Uh, and, and next slide, um, as we think about, you know, really our, our breath, uh, you know, we, we today impact 52 million Americans, um, and, and, and that's really because of 
uh, two clients that we work with, the health plans and the employers. Uh, and and uh, since the acquisition of Livongo, we have more than uh, three quarters of a million members in the United States using uh, our, our devices and doing chronic management. Um, we have over 600 health systems who are a third client uh, around the world using our platform. Uh, next slide, please. Um, again, this kind of just goes over who we work with, uh, over 12,000 worldwide employers. Um, some of the Fortune 500 companies like IBM, uh, Lowe's, Microsoft, Target, um, and even the health plans that you've heard of, Guidewell, Letna, United, um, the Blue Cross Blue Shield plans, uh, and, and, and uh, global health plans that you've heard of, AIG, A A A X, uh, sorry, AXA, uh, many of those global insurers. And again, uh, as we talk about the health systems, uh, majority of the health systems in the United States around the world use our technology. And I think the reason that it's worth mentioning that is, is because as we think about amplifying the ecosystem, um, having a role with all three of these stakeholders is really important for the member, uh, especially as Mike said, as, as you try to decrease the fragmentation that's out there. Uh, as you try to um, orchestrate uh, devices and data into the EMR, um, having all of that uh, is, is super important for health systems as well as members. Uh, next slide, please. And, and, you know, as we think about virtual care and, and remote patient monitoring, um, you know, we think about how this, uh, the, the, the environment that we're in, healthcare, was traditionally built on clinicians like myself. Uh, you know, there's a waiting room for the physician. Why? Because we can't allow the physician to wait. Uh, we want patients to wait for him or her. That, that, that traditional sense is, is archaic uh, because everyday patients, everyday consumers today, they are bringing their expectations uh, that they experience in retail with Amazon or in banking with Bank of America, how, you know, those expectations from everyday industries, they're bringing it in into healthcare. They expect healthcare to be the very similar experience of when you buy online or book a ticket online or you transfer money from you to your babysitter or, or to your spouse that experience is what they're expecting now in healthcare. And as we think about remote patient monitoring, we think about digital health uh, as holistically, um, we think about the one-to-many model, eliminating the waiting room, uh, allowing patients to access healthcare where and whenever they are, uh, and essentially removing the friction that we traditionally have. Next slide, please. You know, at the bottom of this, there, there, there's a future of health and, and, and care uh, where we believe it's going to be digital first, but not digital only. Uh, and, and, and what that means is health systems, uh, payers, they are going to employ digital tools throughout. Uh, but at the same time, we must be embedded with the health systems. The health systems are really at the center of the trust. Uh, they're the ones that have invested the billions of dollars in geographic footprint, uh, the bricks and mortar, and they have the specialists and the capabilities to take care to the next level. Not all care can be digital, uh, but certainly it can be the first step. Uh, and as we think about it, next slide, we think about whole person care. Uh, as you think about remote patient monitoring, you may have one niche uh, or one product that's doing one disease, but, but you can't be focused on just one disease or a certain part of the population. To, to, in order to grow technology and, and healthcare at scale, you have to think about whole person care, being able to take care of the patient, regardless of who they are, regardless of what diseases they have. Uh, and, and, and it's important to think of it that way because otherwise you're fragmenting care. Uh, you're, you're making care isolated and that's not helping the healthcare system. That's actually why we got into this problem for the first place. When we created isolated uh, health centers, when we created isolated uh, non-interoperable systems, patients can't just go across the street and get the same care or continue to get their care because their system is not connected. And, and as you think about remote patient monitoring and digital health, 
think about uh, the one to many and, and, and removing the seams. As we think about delivering millions of visits uh, over, the, uh, over the year, uh, either in primary care that we're growing or urgent care, which we've been known for, or chronic disease management, we think that the data really needs to be interoperable. Obviously, the patient needs to own it. But if I send the patient to Michael and Mass General, then that data should be very seamlessly sent to them. And it can't be isolated. I can't create an app to my device that is proprietary and isolated to all the other infrastructures. Again, you cannot go banking with an ATM card and it doesn't talk to your other banks. It all has to be connected. Otherwise, it just doesn't work and it's not scalable. And as we think about whole person care, we think about that ecosystem needs to be connected throughout. Uh, next slide. And, and that's, that's really why we thought about partnering with Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft obviously is, is one of the very large trusted global companies, many of the health systems and health plans are built on it. And as we continue to integrate with Microsoft, we'll be able to send our data uh, to health systems like Mass General and, and to other developers. As there are entrepreneurs and startup companies building on the Microsoft cloud, they can easily build within our system. So I think that that's really important. And the last slide really touches on, um, the last two slides, sorry, it really touches on how we think about remote patient monitoring. It needs to be effortless. The patient cannot be dependent on mobile signal or sorry, on, on broadband. You have to think about equitable care. Um, and so we think about our devices are all, all cellularly enabled. Uh, they come within uh, the system and, 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 and essentially uh, you can start using them right away. And all of the signals that we receive and we provide are personalized. They're not robotic. They're not automated text. Patients want to be treated as individuals, and you have to send those personalized messages. And then the last thing I'll say about our, our program is that it's human-centered. It cannot be AI-centered. It cannot be automated-centered. It needs to be human-centered. You need to feel and, and get the empathy that, that, that humans provide each other. Uh, and support each other for in order to create change in healthcare. And again, the last slide just kind of goes over some of the diseases that we're following today. And as, as we continue to grow our pipeline, I think it's really important to stress that we, we cannot do this, um, you know, in isolation. We need to do this in partnership. We need to do this uh, in an open centric model. And, and, and I think the most important thing in all of this is to continue to provide empathy. We as humans need uh, and want to feel and touch each other. And as we expand digital health, that somewhat becomes physically hard. Uh, but when you provide emotional empathy to each other, uh, virtually or in person, that helps our human spirit connecting with each other. And that's the only way that will empower folks to change. Thank you, Maria. Thank you so much, Cheyenne. There was, there's so much great insights and obviously trends with what Michael was saying as well. I think it's really important we see this theme of equitable access, equitable um, care, because that's also a major mission of the work we do here at um, IEEE. So with that, I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Narendra Mangra. He is actually co-chair of the IEEE SA Telehealth Industry Connections Program that I mentioned earlier. He's also the principal at uh, GlobeNet LLC. And I kind of like the way he, he kind of defines himself as a transdisciplinarian. So Narendra. Thank you, Maria. Um, so a lot of actually what uh, I'll be speaking about follows from directly from uh, Michael's comments about the care continuum and Cheyenne's comments about interoperability. And that touches a lot of the work we do here at the IEEE SA Telehealth Industry Connections Initiative. So it, I can share a bit more about some of the work we're doing and on the next slide. You will see that um, what we've done is actually looked at the continuum of care uh, for the whole person and, and actually look at a better way to structure this uh, so that we can better address it for, for both the tele portion and the healthcare portion. So we look at healthcare uh, as really uh, along the lens of the continuum of care, and we break it up into to several sectors. And, and we are looking at remote monitoring services. We're looking at clinics and private practices, hospitals and ambulatory care, nursing facilities, and long-term care. 
part of the reason for doing that is that from a, from a, from a technical perspective, there's clear differences between the service area, the capacity, the quality of experience that are going to be needed and the, the types of uh, capabilities that will be needed for these areas. And that way we can have more of a seamless way of looking at it as opposed to a siloed version. We also recognize that depending where you happen to be and, and, and which part of the world you happen to be, there may be some combination of different technologies that may be there. So you may be looking at a wireless LAN or Wi-Fi. You may be looking at fixed networks. You may be looking at cellular type networks or non-terrestrial types of networks, uh, including satellite. So no matter what type of technology or networks we're looking at, we can easily break it up into four basic key components. So we can look at it from the access, and that is how do you get onto the, the tele, uh, telecoms uh, section and access to healthcare as well. And of course, for the service delivery, delivery portion, how do you receive and provide care uh, as well? So these are more of a traditional telecom aspect. And, and, and basically what we're looking for for the access is access from both the consumer and the healthcare provider's perspective. From a service delivery, we're looking primarily at the network equipment and types of uh, end user equipment. And, uh, and that may be, for example, different types of cellular technologies, for example, different, your device may be very different and have different capabilities, your form factor, are they wearables and a whole host of different areas. The other areas we're also looking at are really in, uh, in related to patient and provider operations management. So here we're actually looking uh, primarily from, from an interoperability lens and the ability to provide a robust uh, type of uh, services. So we can look at uh, IT systems from a hospital uh, perspective, for example, and that will include your EHR, your health informatics, any type of trending and records management and any type of equipment for store and forward type of uh, uh, services. And of course, part of that uh, analysis would include personnel and the operations aspect as well. For, for the healthcare uh, hubs and interoperability, we, we understand that at some point you may be in the remote monitoring area and, and you may be needing some additional services or follow on services. Um, so how do we be basically enable that type of interoperability? And at this point, all I'm talking about at this point is really about healthcare. But in, in the real world, uh, we actually need to consider that we are going to be interoperating with other ecosystems, such as transportation, public safety, and a whole host of different areas. And, and we have a way of looking at that as well. But I just wanted to at least focus on the healthcare portion, uh, specifically for the remote monitoring services. Now, for, for the remote monitoring services, if you were to look at a, a very simple niche case example for mobile and mobile only, we will see in the next slide that even that can get very complicated very quickly. So, what we know, or at least a, a generalization, uh, is that generally in an urban area, we can assume that there is some level of connectivity in most cases. Uh, it doesn't mean there's accessibility for everyone. There may be a lot of issues related to having the right equipment, having the ability to have uh, to pay for services, maybe additional funding, access to healthcare uh, services as well may be an issue. So there is an accessibility portion that's across the board for urban and rural area. But generally, we understand that urban area may have more infrastructure. The, but that leaves a whole uh, so other set of areas that are not shown uh, here by the, by in, in your screen, it may appear to be brown or, or uh, orange uh, or tan type of uh, dots. Um, those are the urban areas. The other areas are the rural areas that, that people live, uh, work, live, and play, and need access to healthcare services. So there are different types of healthcare delivery points. Uh, and that's uh, shown in the blue areas. You can see there's a lot more of those. And uh, they are not necessarily all hospitals. I mean, we know that you may need hospitals and uh, it may require different type of hospital or very specialized care. The blue dots you see here could be anything from a pharmacy that offers very, very basic uh, services to, to a, um, a full-fledged hospital complex that may provide advanced care. And as you can see there, there, there are a whole lot of gaps. So how do you reach, how do you address the, the urban and the rural populations um, to be able to have access to healthcare services? So one way to do that, a very easy way to look at that is maybe some sort of mobile communications, whether it be by satellite or by cellular. And you will see from, from the different shades of green, 
that there are, most places have some level of uh, mobile penetration rate where uh, some, uh, a lot of the population have access to some sort of communications. But the picture can be deceiving in that, in reality, it is not as clean as that is. So not every square inch of every uh, country has the same level of service. And that is something we need to, to, to understand and, and be able to address. So even though we say you have cellular service, it doesn't mean that everyone has 5G service or even 4G service or even 3G service. Um, so so that, is a, that is another level of complexity we need to address. So also the urban and rural areas use uh, different types of telehealth services. We can use that to address different types of inequality. So we can look at different um, uh, social vulnerability indexes and different risk factors to be able to take that even one step further. But generally speaking, telehealth does extend the reach and the depth of the different types of services we can offer. And mobile uh, remote patient monitoring actually has the ability to reach even further as far as a large geographical area, as well as address a, a, um, different types of telehealth services. The level of services rendered is really going to be based on the quality of, um, of the capabilities you have in the infrastructure and, and your ability to reach different uh, healthcare professionals. And uh, as you can see, some of the work on our next slide, we, we actually have um, different types of, um, of work streams that we try to address um, different uh, themes uh, within the telehealth industry. So for example, we have a work stream dedicated to connectivity and accessibility. And that is essentially being able to get access to telecommunication services and primarily healthcare access. We're looking at, uh, and the next two are actually um, are, are very closely related, and that we're looking at the types of telehealth services that can be offered, but out, that also depends on the type of healthcare technologies we have at our disposal. So the better your equipment and the ability to provide service, the better the different types of services you can offer. So we're looking at two different areas, Do it, it providing services um, that, that we currently provide in, in better ways, and given our ability to provide services, can we do different things um, that we weren't able to do before? So, so a bit of both uh, that we want to be able to offer. Security and privacy, um, that goes without saying, we, we do need it minimally for, uh, for uh, compliance uh, with different regulatory standards. But overall, it's, it's a basic fundamental tenet for, of trust and, and privacy that is expected. And actually, that leads into different initiatives that I'll discuss shortly. We're also working on the telehealth lexicon, and there's a lot of work that has been done in that front uh, to be able to develop a, a framework for, um, to address the different types of telehealth or virtual care. We're also looking at education and at communications and be able to have outreach program about uh, education and digital literacy. And of course, um, and a whole lot more, uh, a whole lot more uh, initiatives that includes the, the mobile remote patient monitoring uh, uh, program we have coming up. So as you can see from the next slide, we, we not only look at telehealth specifically within the telehealth uh, industry connections, there are other related initiatives. So there's a lot of standards development initiatives that's ongoing at this point, too numerous to mention. We are looking at it in, uh, on different areas as well. So we're looking at it from the International Network Generations Roadmap. This is an IEEE program that's looking at three, five and 10 year horizons. And there are, and there are a number of different groups related that includes applications and services, connecting the unconnected, satellite, there's a security working group that looks at privacy and trust in detail, and a whole host of other areas. There's about 15 working groups in general. There is a transdisciplinary framework that actually takes telehealth and say, okay, this is telehealth as we, are, as we have discussed before, but how does it uh, interact with, for example, public safety? How does it interact with the transportation systems, uh, especially if we're looking at emergency uh, vehicles? Then uh, we're looking at the pub uh, public safety technology task force, where not only are we looking at uh, the whole, whole person as in the continuum of care, but we're looking at a whole community aspect. So there's actually a use case there on public health and the spread of coronavirus uh, that's, that's provided in, in the white paper there. In P1950, they were looking at, as well as the rural development uh, industry connections, we are looking at uh, and, uh, different types of geographical areas, an urban and a rural area, and the healthcare ecosystem is featured among other ecosystems and see how they interact with each other. 
And of course, last and, and certainly not least is the telehealth IC that I described earlier, and that is the transforming the telehealth paradigm, sustaining connectivity, accessibility, privacy, and security for all. And you will see, and if you wanted more information about this particular program, on the next slide, you have a link on how to find out more about it. And if this is something of interest, you can certainly uh, welcome to, to join and find out more information. Thank you very much. Thank you, Narendra. <clears throat> so as you all can see, there's, you know, in, in the world of IEEE, we, we touch little portions of the challenge, right? We know that not one person or not one group can solve many of the challenges that we, we were having, especially when it comes to the discussion of equitable care. But more and more, and I'm going to pose this first question to Mike, because we have a few minutes to have some discussion. Um, you know, we, we hear more and more this idea of patient-centered design, patient-centered devices. So, you know, you think on the surface of it, like this is pretty self-explanatory, but um, maybe you can like just share what maybe like your, maybe your hospital has a definition or just your research, like what exactly are we saying either from a clinical and or technical perspective when we talk about patient-centered devices, patient-centered systems? Sure thing, Maria. And it's a, it's a great question. Um, I don't want to speak for my hospital or many of the others out there, but I can at least tell you my observations. And that being that typically when an organization such as a hospital is designing a program or uh, designing uh, an integrated uh, is that it's of their operations, their tech often developed, right? And it's really operations and capabilities, but that's not how the world works necessarily. Uh, typically, and I really liked the uh, example given before about the patient going across the street to get some care and that data not pulling them. Uh, our patients are just looking for care. It, it, we really be designing around them so that regardless of which are using, regardless of what devices we're using uh, within virtual care, that, that that data can can follow with them. And also that we have some idea, we know them, right, Where, wherever they go. Uh, and that's unfortunately just not the confines we're working in right now from a knowledge point. Um, now, I think that also goes hand in hand with you know, defining access uh, for patients. And we talked about some of the social determinants um, in, in some of the other areas of just making care more equitable, such as low tech literacy, uh, making uh, the technology available for whether you're an English speaking patient or you're a non English speaking patient, whether you have disabilities, uh, when you have access to the network. All of that also has to be taken into consideration consideration when we're designing our programs. And I, I think to answer your question that just and really summarize it, I think all of that is what needs to be considered when we're designing. For sure. Um, Narendra, anything you would like to add to that concept? <laughs> sure. Um, and actually there's a, I mean, I, I like the ability of our technologies to be, to have a, a strong role into to, to how patients are being uh, treated. But I recognize ultimately, fundamentally, this is not about uh, replacing a doctor for a patient relationship. It is really meant to enhance. So foremost, it really should enhance the patient and provider relationship. That is the fundamental thing. So all of the different technologies we have are really meant to be able to serve that purpose. So the doctor would, would have, the healthcare provider would have as much information at their disposal to make uh, better uh, decisions. And the patient ha has the ability to look at their information in, a, in an easy to understand manner as well for both patient and provider. Mm, excellent, excellent points. Um, so just one final question. Um, I'm gonna start with you Narendra and obviously Mike, you can definitely add your idea to there. Um, like, so we talk about all these challenges, you know, good in a good way. And we know there's an opportunity for either standards development or better policy, that kind of thing. But based on like your observations, you're involved in many different kinds of cool programs. Like what, what do you perceive as like the biggest gap, you know, or something we're not really addressing head on when we talk about this proliferation of devices and, surface, and services in this growing world of remote patient monitoring? Silos. <laughs> uh, basically, there's a lot of different types of uh, fragmented uh, solutions, maybe proprietary solutions. 
So we need to get to a point where, where we're a bit more interoperable. Our devices should be reflective of that. And we understand that there may be different variations in the types of devices and networking capabilities and the types of services that may be offered. But at some point, we want to be able to get to the point where we can communicate seamlessly back and forth, no matter what device or, or technology you happen to be on, and no matter what healthcare provider you are, you are speaking with, at least there's interoperability on that side as well for a seamless uh, overall end-to-end -end care. For sure. How about you, Mike? <laughs> I, I completely agree with that. Uh, and the only uh, thing I would add is extensibility uh, being another sort of, of gap and challenge. So that is the future proofing of the technology being whatever it may be, the, the, the vendor technology platform or the devices themselves, making sure that you know we're, we're instilling some type of uh, future proof in there for whether it be the health system or the patient so that they don't have to buy another device in, in two years or something of that nature. Uh, but then also allowing, um, you know, data to flow from that technology to other applications and, 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 other, and such, and even uh, for analytics and reporting, things of that nature, um, huge need. For sure. I think that's really great. You guys give some hopefully parting thoughts to our audience and, um, you know, we, we covered quite a bit today. Uh, again, I just want to remind everybody, and Mike and, and Narendra are also uh, part of that uh, advisory team for the telehealth competition. You know, it's called Rethink the Machine, Transforming Remote Patient Monitoring to a Patient-Centered Care System. Um, we're looking for people who have innovative ideas on those other systems, but as well as how they're going to address some of the challenges we started to like, you know, pick at uh, during this conversation today. So please visit the website to learn more and how you can uh, get your idea in. And of course, the, the telehealth program, uh, I think Narendra covered it really well. And of course, if you have an idea or you want to participate to any of these topics, please uh, join us. We're open and our doors are open. We have many different kinds of sessions and outreaches like we're doing actually right now with uh, Call Me 2X, but you know, through our many different programs, we educate, bring awareness, bring experts like Mike and Cheyenne and Narendra to talk about these types of things or case studies or whatever it might be. So if any of you are interested in talking about something really cool that you may be working on, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to me at any time. We, um, if you want to get involved in industry connections, incubator programs, standards working groups, or whatever it might be, you want to write an article, um, definitely reach out and we always welcome, you know, volunteer participation. So for now, I want to thank Narendra, Mike, and Cheyenne for being a part of this panel, for your time, sharing your insights, and obviously um, your dedication to really starting to change the face of what we think is going to look like remote patient monitoring and while we're addressing some of those critical challenges that seem to be still nagging at our heels. And, um, and I want to thank all of you, the audience, for being with us and listening to this presentation, and we hope that you come along and join some of our programs. So until then, continue to stay safe and well and enjoy the rest of the symposium.